Well, our next speaker should be well known to this audience, and I hope some of you had a chance to see her recent exhibition, Salazar, Portraits of Influence in Spanish New Orleans, uh, a fantastic exhibition that sadly closed last month, but um, uh, I think uh, there are some online resources. Sibel Gantar was born and raised in New Orleans and earned an MA in the History of Decorative Arts and Design from Parsons. She worked at the Metropolitan Museum of the Arts Department of European Sculpture and Decorative Arts from 1999 to 2007 and completed PhD coursework in the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. She taught art history at Montclair State University, FIT, and Sotheby's Institute of Art. After completing a pre-doctoral fellowship at the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery, she returned to New Orleans to open Degas Gallery here in the nearby Warehouse District and to complete her dissertation on early New Orleans portraiture. Her scholarship focuses on Gulf South history, and she regularly teaches a course on New Orleans art history at Tulane University. And her recent exhibition, Salazar, Portraits of Influence in Spanish New Orleans, 1782 to 1802, is the subject of her lecture today. Please join me in welcoming Sibel Gantar. So thank you for having me, and I'm so very impressed with all the great work that the Trust is doing. This is my first time participating in an event, and I'm just very impressed with it all. And also, Philippe, I'm so impressed with your lecture. I see a very evocative exhibition in your future, um, based on some of the things that you were describing. So while my exhibition at Ogden Museum of Southern Art, the entrance of which is shown here, closed in September before your arrival, We'll make up for that this morning with this overview about Jose Salazar, a portrait painter in late 18th century New Orleans. Salazar has the distinction of being the only colonial painter from New Spain presently documented to have practiced in North America. Of Spanish ancestry, Salazar's forebears had dwelled in the town of Merida on the Yucatan for many generations before the painter relocated to New Orleans in 1784. This 1774 map of the West Indies includes Merida directly across the Gulf of Mexico and importantly includes New Orleans, which is outlined in green at the top, as part of the Circum-Caribbean, of which it was a part culturally and politically. I placed a reproduction of this map together with original documents pertaining to Salazar's life in the first room of the exhibition. These documents included the original Spanish census of 1791 in which Salazar and his family are recorded, as well as the surviving inventory of his household written in French, listing his furnishings, clothing, silver, and several slaves. These documents take on added meaning because we have no self-portrait of the artist. Soon after he'd established himself here, Salazar signed this Spanish invoice with an exuberant flourish in 1786 documenting a series of portraits he painted for the Dijon family of New Orleans. It reads, received from Senor Dijon by Salazar the following, 20 pesos for the portrait of his eldest daughter, 30 pesos for the portrait of his father, and so on, received on October 13, 1786. Also among his surviving papers is this invoice in French from Mercier and Company for art supplies, including a dozen black crayons, a frame, eight paintbrushes, charcoal, and a watercolor box for the painting of miniatures. The watercolor box is the most costly item at $15. At bottom right is shown Salazar's miniature of Angelica Monsanto Urquhart, which is kept here at the collection. Incidentally, Angelica's descendant, Catherine Urquhart Warren, was a founder of the Museum of Modern Art and Newport Preservation Society, and preserved two Salazars in her collection. And in order to evoke Salazar's practice of such miniature painting, a watercolor box was recreated for the exhibition from an 18th century example using period mahogany and hardware. This one a copy of that on view at the Metropolitan Museum's American Wing. And this slide shows the reverse, so you can see how the lid of the box functioned as an easel. 
The exhibition began with this 1792 portrait of Spanish attendant Martin Durald, which remains, as do a number of Salazar's paintings, with their subject's descendants. Martin Durald's daughter married Louisiana's first American governor, William C. C. Claiborne, speaking to the colony's impending Americanization during the 1790s, a key theme in Salazar's oeuvre, evoked by his numerous American subjects. Salazar shows the French-born Durald wearing his Spanish uniform and in a characteristic three-quarter length format with his hand tucks, tucked inside his vest, a pose that reflected the mannerly precepts of the day as set forth in texts such as the rudiments of genteel behavior of 1737, which specifically instructed the posture. Again, we see the same posture in this portrait of Andres Almanester, a Spanish notary who became New Orleans' leading citizen and benefactor. The name Almanester actually means monastery, as in the eighth century, his ancestors hid within monastery walls from Moorish attack. Salazar adds a crest, which is enlarged at the right, with a tiny figure bearing a hatchet outside a church, referencing this story. Importantly, Salazar used a red priming layer, which was a Spanish and Italian tradition that added luminosity. This is a very characteristic aspect of his work, and in this painting especially, you can observe the red ground showing through. You can see it up here and right here. I should also emphasize that Salazar's stiff formality, coupled with a kind of naivete, comes directly out of Mexican portraiture, um, though he certainly evolved. Other examples of Salazar's work include his likeness of Marion Dragon, the daughter of a Greek-born military officer who settled in Louisiana. Dragon was of African, French, Canadian, and Indian ancestry. In 1854, Marion's grandson, George Pendelli, ran for alderman of New Orleans, and when his own racial identity was challenged, a high-profile slander trial ensued. When Pend while Pendelli won, his descendants today understand and acknowledge their Senegalese ancestry. Of course, Salazar emerged from Nueva España's equally racially complex society. This Costa painting, literally a painting of race, shows a Spanish artist creating a portrait of his albino wife, whose own racial identity is belied by her pale complexion. However, the darker complexion of their son, or Tornatra, reveals her to be part African or Indian. While this is not Salazar's own work, within the exhibition, this image not only evoked his background, but also provided a glimpse within a colonial painter's studio for exhibition visitors, some of whom were the mixed race descendants of his own subjects. This Madonna-esque portrait shows Clarice Leduc, the wife of Spanish notary Pedro Pedesclo, with her infant son who holds a toy kite. Salazar records Clarice's name and age of 23 years, and importantly, he titles himself as an American painter, signing the portrait Salazar Americano, identifying himself rather precisely as a New World painter in relation to his European counterparts. Obviously, what Salazar knew of his more northeastern counterparts in Philadelphia and New York is not known. For any of you not well versed in the story of North American portraiture, I digress for a moment to tie two landmark works into the discussion. Recently, I completed an article about this iconic work titled Dean Barclay and His Entourage, or more simply, The Bermuda Group of 1729. The picture shows the Anglo-Irish philosopher George Barclay with the group he had assembled to found St. Paul's College in Bermuda and to otherwise found, and found churches and convert savages to Christianity. Sadly, this plan was ill-fated and the group disbanded. In any event, the artist John Smybert had been invited along to teach painting at the college. Later, he was commissioned by the expedition's benefactor, John Wainwright, to paint this picture. Smybert includes a self-portrait at the far left, a portrait of Wainwright as the focal point, and Barclay himself at the far right. As I argue, the celebrated Philadelphia portraitist Charles Wilson Peale not only knew Barclay's Bermuda entourage, 
He further created this work, The Family of Charles Wilson Peale, now in the collection of the New York Historical Society, as a direct homage to Smybert's legacy. Here, Peale shows himself leaning over the table, his brother St. George at the left end of the table, and his wife Rachel in the center steadying their infant. An apple peel on the table serves as a well-known eponymous reference to his name, Peel. That Peel witnessed Smybert's painting is nearly certain. In his autobiography, he records his 1765 visit to the deceased Smybert studio in Boston. Peel wrote, quote, a number of his pictures are left unfinished, and they are in a style vastly superior to any I have seen before, end quote. Frequented by American artists of the period, Smybert's color shop was by then managed by his nephew, John Moffat, and contained many of his paintings, sculptures, and prints. The Bermuda Group's presence among them and Peel's observation of it seem inevitable. Numerous commonalities tie these paintings, including the center table, the placement of the artists at the far left, the scrolls of sketches, and other aspects. Unlike George Barclay's thwarted plan for a, quote, reservoir of learning and religion streaming through all parts of America, purging the ill manners and irreligion of our colonies, end quote, recorded for posterity by Smybert's brush, Peel's vision is similarly projected in his family portrait. Akin to Barclay's own, it came to be realized as an enduring chapter in American art in the form of the Peel family's prolific contribution to the arts. While not directly related to Smybert and Peel, this large family group, the Montague family, by Salazar bears mentioning in their context. Colonial Louisiana had remained under French control until 1762 when it was ceded to Spain, who regarded it as a bulwark against incursions into their vast territory stemming into South America. Like Peel, Salazar was a purely American painter, Americano, who arrived with a wave of immigration instigated by the earliest Spanish governors to populate the colony. This portrait of the Montague family shows the Paris-trained surgeon Joseph Montague, oops, here, um, arranged as if to perform a family musicale, a familiar trope that emphasized their familial harmony. Such scenes were very popular. Uh, for example, this is such a musicale by Zoffany, the Italian-born neoclassicist who spent his career in London. There was a tradition of showing young ladies playing the forte piano, as shown here. And in the exhibition, we did include much decorative arts and furniture. Um, here, the Salazar is shown with a forte piano, as appears in the painting, as well as a Windsor chair. And here is a broader view of the space that it was shown in. In this detail, we can zero in on Dr. Montague, who holds a triangular pin from his vest. A symbol of equality, the triangle appeared in numerous French revolutionary prints, as shown at right. This one showing liberty, demonstrating the equality of a European and an African, with a resplendent triangle shining above as the evils of injustice fly away to the left. And the triangle also reflects the Egyptian leveling instruments used in construction that later related to the idea of moral balance. Such leveling instruments have been associated with Freemasonry for centuries. So it is not surprising that Montague's triangle pin is similar to that appearing in this painting of Philippe d'Orléans, grandmaster of the Orient of France, a descendant of the um, gentleman whose collection you viewed at Noma, and I believe the last um, owner of it. And this last example in our overview of Salazar's portraiture is this painting of William Dunbar, the Natchez-based Scottish scientist and explorer who was a friend of Thomas Jefferson and who is noted for his expedition to map the Washita River and other scientific discoveries. When I discovered this work, it was covered in a metal spandrel that obscured its edges. However, when the work was brought to New Orleans for conservation and preparation of the exhibit, we had the spandrel removed, and Salazar's characteristic fictive oval surround was revealed, establishing his authorship with certainty. Importantly, Salazar's formulaic use of this format revealed not only his awareness not only of the history of European portraiture, but also of contemporary prints. 
18th century French prince of the newly elected National Assembly co-opted such oval surrounds from centuries of monarchical imagery minus royal affectations to establish a democratizing format for the new legislative body. Salazar similarly utilized this format that appears to have been more than acceptable to his American patrons. So now that you've had an overview, I'd like to focus on the story of several interconnected Salazars and a little bit of the research behind them. What we're looking at here is a pre-treatment photograph of this portrait of a gentleman that belongs to historic Germantown in Pennsylvania. Before I encountered this work, it had been identified as a Salazar with which I agreed, his oval, three-quarter pose, palette, and red priming layer showing through layers of surface paint provided good evidence. I was told by Germantown staff that the painting was a likeness of Daniel William Cox of Philadelphia based on some research done by a guide and published in the Germantown Crier under the title A Mysterious Portrait. And it became more mysterious for me when at the National Portrait Gallery I was able to locate a record of the painting having been identified as Dr. George Bensel. And I estimated the work to be about 1787. Despite this confusion, Germantown curator Lara Keim and I agreed that the portrait needed conservation, so off it went to uh, Winneter for treatment under the supervision of Joyce Stoner and her fellows, and here is a picture I took in the studio there in 2015. So here's a before and after, before on the left, after on the right, and after the restoration, you can see the waistcoat is much whiter and abrasions have been infilled. So this was a good project in preparation for the exhibition, but the question had remained for me about the identity of the subject. The article, A Mysterious Portrait, had zeroed in on the identification of Daniel Cox as the subject based on information in an 1888 Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts exhibition catalog. And on the right, you can see that the catalog described a half-length portrait, and this was a plausible attribution except for mismatched measurements and the notation of a signature that the portrait on the left was lacking. So this discounted that attribution of the, of the sitter. For me, this was a very promising error. If the sitter at the left was not Daniel, then where was that portrait? So I began researching him to try to find it. I learned that Daniel William Cox was the great-grandson of Dr. Daniel Cox, born in 1640, shown at left, a prominent London physician at the court of Charles II. He began acquiring land in the American colonies as early as 1680. Most of the acreage was in the provinces of western New Jersey, and the so-called Carolina, Florida. Those pro provinces came to be partially administered by his son, Colonel Daniel Cox, shown on the right, who settled in New Jersey. In 1722, the colonel wrote a book describing the semi-fictitious Carolina, some areas of which were held by his family, titled A Description of the English province of Carolina by the Spaniards called Florida and by the French La Louisiane. The key words here are English province. This map folds out of the colonel's book. What it shows is that in 1718, when Bienville claimed Louisiana for France after his long journey down the Mississippi, that in 1698, the Cox family had already been bequeathed the region for the British crown. So before Louisiana was Louisiana, it was Carolina. Wisely, in 1769, the Coxes exchanged their worthless grant for land in what is now New York. So almost humorous in retrospect, Cox's frontispiece describes the preface within that contains some obviously prescient considerations on the consequences of the French making settlements in the Carolina, which to us today is very humorous. Um, so shown here is the colonel's grandson, Tench Cox, a one-time loyalist. On the left is his portrait by Jeremiah Paul of the 1790s, and on the right, a Samuel Sartan print after it. In addition to a political career, Tench operated the merchant firm of Cox and Fraser, and he purchased vast acreage in the Mid-Atlantic that secured his family's later generations. It was work for this brother 
It was work for his brother, Tench, for Cox and Fraser, that brought, brought Daniel to New Orleans and explains the existence of a portrait by Salazar. Given all of this remarkable history, I reached out to the Cox family and quickly located Salazar's canvas, which I am proud to say is now a part of the collection here at the Historic New Orleans Collection. So it is this painting that was exhibited by the Pennsylvania Academy in 1888 and described at Wright. And of course, on my initial examination of the painting in Princeton, I found the remnants of the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts exhibition label of 1888. Um, I did try to locate original photographs of that exhibit, though unfortunately, there are none. Finally, a close examination shows Salazar's signature and that this is the second and only other known canvas on which he identifies himself as Americano. So this was a wonderful discovery, which dovetailed with another, as we will see. Research at the Frick revealed this portrait of General James Wilkinson, an astonishing find to learn that Salazar had painted this American general who had served in the Revolutionary War under Washington and who relocated to the Mississippi Territory to establish an American military presence and found Fort Adams at Natchez. After a nationwide search from my desk in Manhattan, I located the general only a 15-minute train ride away in Nyack, New York. In the home of a descendant who was a yoga instructor who had surrounded him with Buddhas and other Indian artifacts. As Louisiana historian Charles Guyeray proved, Wilkinson's correspondence with Spanish officials under the moniker Agent 13 reveals that from the time of his first visit to New Orleans in 1787, he was their pensioner and informant, despite his lengthy role as commanding general of the United States Army. Involved with Aaron Burr in an effort to invade Mexico, Wilkinson even betrayed his co-conspirator by sending an incriminating ciphered letter to Thomas Jefferson. So he was a very duplicitous guy. In 1811, Wilkinson was court-martialed himself by President Madison and accused of collusion with the Spanish. Integral to the case against him was this earlier publication by the merchant Daniel Clark of proofs of the corruption of General James Wilkinson and of his connection with Aaron Burr, though he was found not guilty. Today online, you can find Wilkinson's Memoirs of My Own Times, published in 1816, an attempt to vindicate his reputation for posterity. Yet evidence of his treason surfaces. In his online papers from the University of Pittsburgh, I came across the following passage written in December 1806 that speaks to his ambitions. He wrote, quote, I shall live to laugh at my vile detractors as I have done all of my life. And after being crowned Emperor of Mexico in place of Burr, I will return to spend the eve of my life in my native state and not far from Baltimore." End quote. So it's not surprising that Wilkinson died in Mexico City in 1825 pursuing a Texas land grant. Signed by Salazar in 1799, further research revealed that the portrait had been painted in June of 1799 by Salazar as the general anxiously awaited a ship for over two weeks to transport him to New York. After being detained in New Orleans, the general appears to have sailed out in the third week of June, since by June 30th, his London-bound ship, the William of Charlestown, had traveled the 150 miles to the Belize, a small fort at the mouth of the Mississippi. Arriving in New York in August, Wilkinson wrote candidly to Alexander Hamilton, quote, the imbecility of the Spanish government on the Mississippi is as manifest as the ardor of the Louisianians is obvious. A single individual of hardy enterprise presenting himself with directorial credentials and hoisting the national standard at New Orleans might depose the Spanish administration in one hour. Like Wilkinson's comments to Hamilton masking his intimacy with the Spanish, Salazar's Hispanicized portrait of the resplendently uniformed general sets his duplicities into high relief. Among the many details of the painting consistent with Salazar's oeuvre, such as the red ground and fictive oval, um, is the manner in which the lace is painted, so like that on other works, which show his unmistakable heavy outline. 
The most striking aspect of Wilkinson's ensemble is a glittering oval plate embossed with an American eagle and banderole above crossed flags. The plate is adhered to his shoulder belt and appears to have been further linked to a jacket buttonhole by a gold cord strung from the top. Given Wilkinson's pride in this ornament, it may have been commemorative of a specific territorial coup he was involved uh, in, or perhaps of the Indians, though it's not known. Uh, this and another portrait led military historian and collector J. Duncan Campbell to identify this uh, closely related silver copper plate um, in his own collection in 1963, though nothing exactly matching Wilkinson's own medallion has turned up. The same object appears in a later portrait of Wilkinson by John Wesley Jarvis of about 1825, though here it is shown pinned to a black sash over his blue major general's coat. Not only recorded by Salazar and Jarvis, we find Wilkinson portraits abound by St. Mamin, Peel, and James Sharples. St. Mamin's profile at the left, an image in which a physio trace was used to record the sitter's profile in exquisite detail, calls to mind 18th century ideals about ideas rather about phrenology and the connection between one's appearance and one's character. In spite of his character flaws, we find Wilkinson's visage expertly reported within the pantheon of America's earliest heroes. As we're aware, Wilkinson was censured for his duplicity. Examining this text at the Pierpont Morgan Library regarding Wilkinson's corruption, I was surprised to discover that it was none other than Daniel Cox who submitted the papers confirming his treason. Here is an image uh, of those portraits of Cox and Wilkinson shown together in the exhibition, together with this rare document. Only weeks after Salazar's death in the last few days of October 1802, this broadside announcing the closing of the port of New Orleans was posted in Natchez. This slide shows the only remaining print of this document in existence in the Archivo General in Seville, Spain. Signed by Captain Joseph Vidal, Spanish Intendant Juan Morales, and the New Orleans notary Pierre Pettisglo, it announced the Spanish Crown's radical maneuver of suspending the American right of deposit at New Orleans, meaning that no American goods could be sold in or exported out of the port. Historian Arthur Whitaker, who calls this proclamation one of the most provocative in the whole history of international rivalry in North America, also has written that the Spanish Crown's closing of the port caused Jefferson's decision to purchase New Orleans and then all of Louisiana. In 1800, the Treaty of San Ildefonso had ceded Louisiana from Spain back to France, though Spain remained in control of the territory until November of 1803. This is Salazar's final signature, written with a trembling hand on his last will and testament in 1802, not long before his death. With his passing, a chapter in our local history closed forever. One might hardly believe it, the presence the existence in North America of a Mexican porch just were it not for the persistent accretion of evidence about Jose Salazar of New Orleans. Slowly, a past life long obscured has taken shape for us. As students of American art, we realize the importance and vitality of his legacy, a collective material fragment that unites our colonial histories, North and South, French, Spanish, and Anglo-American, through the stories of his fascinating patrons. By way of closing, a few notes of interest. Um, not long after the discovery of the Wilkinson portrait, it achieved some notoriety on the auction market, which was very heartening to me as I was preparing uh, the exhibition here, Sky High Salazar, um, on the cover of the main antique digest in March of 2014. And after the exhibition opened, um, at the Ogden, we had a tremendous outpouring of community interest with many descendants um, organizing family tours, which I was delighted to lead. And then in the closing week of the exhibition, these two sisters showed up at my gallery, bringing with them these two paintings of their ancestor, their Spanish ancestor, Captain Al Puente and his wife, which they realized were Salazar by reading about the show in the newspaper and visiting the exhibition. Thank you so much.